Diagnostic starts with history taking and we have five symptoms which we quickly ask. The hearing impairment, the tinnitus, by the way, the joint is also one reason uh, for tinnitus in some patients. You heard the connections. Then we have the vertigo, which I will not touch at all, and the noise is too. But the discharge, because many complain of discharge. And very important for you too is the ear ache. Because this is common in our neighborhood, and we have to know what is coming from the ear and what is co from coming from the teeth. And you see here, Hieronymus Bosch, in his unknown way of interpretation, he has ear and it is cut by a, a knife or a sword and also by a, a spear here. But what is obvious, there is no entrance to the external meatus. So very mis miraculous. But this is now practically the earache. The earache ex is extremely complicated. And we have to go into these details to understand it for our patients. Because they say just, I have this pain here. And now you have to analyze which are the uh, regions. And we have, have first the local pain, which happened around in this ear. And then the referred pain from other areas. And as you see here from this aspect, you see here is trigeminus. But also trigeminus here in the upper part of the external canal. This is a mastoid, this is the tympanic cavity, and this is your stachen tube. And you see here again, it's the ninth nerve. This is the tenth nerve. And then we have also the uh, from the neck, the C2 and C3, which you see here. And you see how difficult it is. And in a way, I had it always on my wall, these things, when they came to check through what, which could it be, only for local pain. But later we will see it's also a site for referred pain. And I, we go on with this. And this has some consequences. You know, one of these tense nerves is the ramus auricularis navivagi. And when you go in with a little speculum, they start coughing, coughing via vagus. And uh, <laughs> when I started with my uh, medical students, they said, if you go deeper, they will die. That's, of course, nonsense, because they do not get a shock. But I had it very often. So you must remove it, try it from another way. That is, as I showed you, the, the, zoon in, uh, the uh, lower zoon in the canal. Uh, also, others start uh, vomiting. This is all uh, ner ner nervous 10. This you have to know when you investigate a patient. And here, for instance, we have another local pain. Zoster herpes, zoster is rather often, you know, it's the second manifestation of varicella zoster virus. And here you have the overlap of C23 and of trigeminus. Yeah? And this is why you have this shape. So you can immediately tell the diagnose just from looking at it and knowing the nervous connections. So these are very important anatomical points we have to keep in our minds. And that is the worst. I tell you a story. I was a doctor, I think 10 years I was specialist. I was even professor and I had a young boy and we were in holidays and he was in the bed in the evening and said, oh, I don't feel very well. I think he was uh, four years old. And I was sitting, oh yeah, and he always said, oh God, I have pain. So I investigated him, not, um, not um, uh, uh, no appendix sign. And so I was sitting at him, it was in the, so one, two, three, or four hours. And suddenly he said, and then I know, a child projects otitis media in the stomach via 10. 
Yeah? And, you, and this is rather often because I was told by many uh, parents they had first trouble in the stomach, seen in there, or they the complain of it, but it was here which was in the meantime. And well, I learned it. And here you see the connections. This is this connection, yeah, it goes to the ear. But also C2 and 3. When you have it here, a pain from here, for instance, Soster can make also pain here. Here I have number 5 is of course, and the, uh, pharing, uh, uh, the number 9, 2. So these connections we have to keep in mind when we don't find a local cause for the uh, pain, and that's why we uh, uh, call it referred pain. The ne next is the discharge. The discharge has different types, serous, mucoid, bloody, purulent, or fetid, and each stands for one disease. And we have uh, to ask other things, but it's not so important. And let us give some examples. This is a painting which I found in Italy from 1324. It was in an altar piece, and I saw this woman keeping her baby. And you look at this wom uh, little baby, you have blood from the nose and blood from the ear. What is this? Classical signs from fracture of the cranium. Yeah? So this painter has very nicely observed it. So that's bloody discharge from the ear. Now, some instruments which we use when we make our examinations. We have, of course, our head mirror. And this is an old tradition. Here, even 1880, we have nicely electrical with different tubes. We have the famous Pulitzer rubber bag. This is tips and the few tuning forks. And by the help of tuning forks, they were able to differ whether it's a disease of the ear, especially of the um, tympanic cavity, or it's a nervous uh, hearing problem. And I will shortly uh, show you now first the, how we do the examination. You see, when we uh, put a um, speculum into the ear canal, we pull the auricle upwards and posteriorly. Why? By this, we get the binding which is in the ear canal by this, the con connection of a cartilaginous part and of a bony part. You get a, a little uh, uh, binding in it. And by this, we pull it backward, straighten it, and then we could, can look at the drum head. So that's the way to look at it. And discharge, you make irrigation with a syringe. And you see these are the old uh, syringes which you have probably seen. Um, and it's a very old principle. You see Celsus did it in ancient Rome. And he, he called it Christa auricularis. So that's an old method, how they cleaned and brought out the rubbish which was in the external ear canal. Here you see these in your museum, in your medical historical museum. Very nice collection of these uh, syringes. From mostly are from the 19th century. And here are the hearing test. By this Weber test, it was also very early inv invented. They compare the bone conduction of the ear and when you put it on the head and you hear it in both sides equally if your ear are normal. And when you put your finger and make a middle ear disease or also some cerumen which you have in, then you project it, of course, in your healthy ear. So that's the Weber test. 
and the other is the rhinitis. There you compare how you hear by air conduction compared to bone conduction. And of course, air conduction you hear better than the other. And by these tests, they could find out what type of hearing problem the patient had. Then we had, of course, not any uh, tunifox, uh, which we still use today, but we started with the electroacoustic um, part, first with uh, uh, tubes and later uh, with uh, different things, as you see here in an audiometer, as we call this instrument, um, from 1960, very complicated, and it is this size. And then it became smaller and smaller, and we could measure also the pressure in the middle ear and all these things, which are today. And even now, since 10 years, we have, of course, the computer included in our tests and can even investigate sleeping newborns by looking for their autoacoustic emissions, which are made in the inner ear. Uh, or even in the brainstem. So the differentiation in this period of 200 years from tuning fork alone to modern is enormously and can give us exactly localization of the disease. In hearing, the eustachian tube plays an important role. And you see this very famous drawing of Brödel. Brödel was a person from uh, Leipzig in the last, in the uh, old, in the uh, 19th century. Then he went to the United States and made these beautifully um, anatomical drawings. And you see, this is about 3.5 centimeter long and the canal is nearly the same, a little bit smaller. Here you see the break between the cartilaginous part and the bony part. So. We test this also because it is also a reason of hard hearing whether your Eustachian tube is open or not and you know it all when you fly. And then also these tests with this ballon with this bag and uh, here from the 19th century a little bit complicated. Today you can test them by simple <coughs> apparatus too. Now some diseases. Um, we have the simplest is the earwax and some other obstructing. We find animals in it, we find molds in it. Uh, we have to look at it. Um, once my secretary came with a pain in the ear and I looked first didn't see much, but then I took the microscope, which is today our main instrument for looking at it. And then I saw a hair piercing her um, temple uh, uh, drum head. Yeah? And this made the pain. And I asked her, have you been to the hair cutters? Yes, I have him. So he had uh, used at the end uh, ventilation, and it was so strong that the hair pierced the drum head. Removing was the therapy. Oops, uh, let me come back. So what is else? So then um, we will have some diseases of the pinna. And then we come to the middle ear, which is a big com complex and very often. Uh, and then with the stapes, I will speak uh, things. And then a little bit of sensory neural hearing. You see it is in the order of outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear, how these diseases uh, are classified. So, yeah, taking out the wax is an old problem, and you see we have found in uh, literature in a hygiene set, uh, set from 4,000 years old in Nineveh. Here you have this little scoop. There's a little spoon at the end and you pull out the earwax. And here are from the, many are from the Roman period um, in different countries. So that's an old method. 
uh, today this uh, Q-tips, I don't know, is it pro uh, popular here in this country? Mm -hmm. And as I tell you, this is nonsense yeah, for the ear. Absolute nonsense. Why? When you take your Q-tip and try to clean the ear canal, then you push the material inside and after it, because there is a normal migration of, of the epithelium from the drum head outside and this is disturbed and so you build up a little hill and then it's even more and it's absolutely nonsense to use these I uh, wrote here down I advise Q-tips only coated with Vaseline for cleaning your nose but never use them in the children uh, then they really um, uh, get more wax than before you can use it here for the carvum that's very good and with some ointment and, but not uh, try to go into it. Now some disease of the oracle. Did you ever heard of restless disease? Yeah, they have our cauliflower ears. That is a very big one. Here you see the pinna and how is from the many blows he get at his ear. This is rather often that you have now piercing the oracle and uh, when you use these uh, non-expensive rings then you get uh, uh, things when you use nickels you get nickel allergy it's very often now it's uh, uh, forbidden but some people take it always how can you prevent this this was invented in Vana I show you look when you go into your archaeologic museum you see and they did multiple piercing for uh, 4,000 years, no, earlier, 6,000 years before here. You can see it in this head because it is realistic. They, they did this and you know all this famous ear made from clay and there are gold rings. So when you use gold and silver, you do not get allergy. So you can learn from Vana. The Indian doctors, they made their lobes longer from the very beginning onwards, also in Africa. But this is, of course, in danger of rupturing. And then in Sushruta, it's an old surgical book of 2000, uh, no, 3,000 years old. He gave about 10 pages how to uh, repair these uh, elongated um, fractures, earlobes, as you can see here. Do you know the episode of Malchus in the Bible? When uh, the arrest, Christ of, uh, arrest of Christ was, then uh, one of the guards um, was cut off his right ear by Peter, St. Peter. And that was Malchus, as he was called. And then Jesus took the earlobe and re-implanted it. And so we can find here in this oil, oil painting <coughs> from 1400 how you see the blood but the re-implantation of Jesus of the oracle. And I call it the first healing by fibrin tissue adhesive in the world. Now there's something practical. The furunculosis of the ear. It's extremely painful. The furuncle is always where you have hairs and ha hairs is only in this part. And why is it is so painful? Because you have no space between the periost and uh, the epithelium of the ear canal. And so by chewing, by talking, you have the pain. And when the patient can, uh, tells you, yes, when I talk, it is painful, you can say it must be a furuncle. And it has, of course, been opened um, and, um, uh, ir ir and, and uh, sucked out. So it's an orphan disease. So the next one. An orphan disease, too, especially in the children, is the serious effusion of the middle ear. Um, it's a growing ear and the ventilation 
is disturbed and um, so it's, it's not a bacterial, it's just a sterile effusion and the terror, but they can't hear. And it's going along onwards and we say you can wait three months, four months till you do a therapy and what do you do? You make a myringotomy and put in a grommet. As you see it here, it's sitting here. Oops. And here you see how we do a mirror to me. We have a do a cut in this part. Behind this is the Eustachian tube, and it's deep. You don't hurt the stapes, which is in this area. That's why you cut here, and then you put in your grommet. Much worse is the acute otitis media. Most it's streptococcus. Pneumonia of many types, and you see 1.6 million fatal cases each year worldwide, especially in children under two years and in immunocompromised com patients. And we give antibiotics, we give nose drops to open the nose because the nose is always um, in this disease uh, is, is obstructed uh, by swollen mucosa and when you have done your incision in the by myotomy you put him into bed and he lies on the affected ears uh, then the secretion the, it's purulent of course in this case uh, comes out and also warm helps and what a big progress we can learn from history is when you look at the time in the beginning of the last century when the sulfonamides and penicillin were investigated before the World War. And you see here is statistics of the cards of the incidence of surgical mastoid mastoiditis in this phase. You see 1930 and then very much about 1936-7, enormous uh, uh, number of uh, surgery for this acute otitis. And then when we started with this, the number goes rapidly down. It's from a hospital in the United States, the numbers. And this was a big, big step forward. Now we have another step, which is very important when your children will have, get this, you, you have a um, different type of treatment that is prophylactic treatment with pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. And that's very effectful, they have shown, because most of these streptococcus um, pro produce uh, um, this um, toxin and Against this you can find this vaccination and you see up to 75% these acute otitis media can be um, prevented. So a very important for your next uh, cases. Now when we have a hole in the drum head, we have two types. We have the central hole. This is a uh, Superative otitis, which is just a problem of secretion of a little bit pain, mostly uh, after a while not painful anymore, but it's running and running. And usually you have to make an operation which we call tympanoplasty. This is a, so a benign time of otitis media. But the word, yeah, and in one of the mummies which I investigated in uh, Egyptian. Museum in Munich, I found this perforation. And this, so you see, are many central perforations, and that is classical for tuberculosis. So I can say this mummy had suffered from tuberculosis. It was 3,000 years ago. The worst type is the so called cholesteatoma. It's a chronic, separative, but there is no discharge in the beginning. When you look into the ear, you see a little white spot here, and it is 
uh, epithelium, nothing than epithelium. And this epithelium has some proteolytic ferments and destroys bone of, uh, and of course the soft tissues and grows very slowly and so long it's in this connection they're here normally but in the, oh, the moment when this dissolves comes out as fetid discharge then they know aha uh -huh, something is wrong and they are hard hearing and this is a very dangerous disease and must be operated in any way because the danger is that this can affect the brain the meningitis you have brain abscess and it w at, in old times it was the most often a uh, cause for death. Also the vessels, the sinus thrombosis and so on. So you see the neighborhood here to the brain is similar as to the joint you just heard. A thing of otosclerosis is another way of middle ear disease and in this we find bone, bone growing on a wrong place. I will show you here in a histology. You see the stapes, as is here, is changed by a different type of normal bone, which you find here. Um, here is the inner ear and this is the ear canal. And you see the bone has eaten up even uh, this foot plate and by this of course you cannot hear and this can be nicely operated uh, by creating a new stapes. I also found this in a very old case uh, from the Bronze Age, 4000 years old. You see here is a normal, yes, this is the oval window, here is a round window. It's a promontorium, that's a healthy ear. And here you see it's occluded. Here is the fixed, bony fixed stapes plate. And it's very, very funny. The stapes have no feet anymore here compared to the healthy side, but while the other ossicles are normal. And you see how long ossicles keep in earth. It was in an area along the Danube River. So this is an old stapes disease and we see we have not new diseases. Most of the diseases I showed you are very old. The last is the sensory nerving hearing loss. In old times it was called perceptive or nerve hearing loss. And they can involve all the parts of the inner ear, which you will also learn a little bit <laughs> during your studies. And we have many factors. Many are genetic, but the most are for us are, are the, the aging person and the acoustic trauma, especially in our, in our new world. Then we have some toxins as uh, pharmaca, autotoxic pharmaca can make this hearing loss and some uh, rare uh, tumors or vascular lesion. But the main is acoustic trauma aging person and genetic influence for hearing loss. And for this we have a very good um, treatment now that means hearing aids. Yeah, the, in, in Hamburg we had a, anatomy, an autologist, autologist and an anatomist that was Wismark and he first tried by experiments to show what cause uh, creates what disease. And in a guinea pig, he could find when you give an acoustic trauma that the corti organ, which you find here as normally, is damaged in the area of 4000 Hz. And you can nicely see how it's degenerated here. It's present here, it's present here, but only in this area. So it was uh, detected rather early and shown. And the same is for uh, the human being at 4000 Hz, and we have a special tuning for, for it, then we can say his problem of hard hearing is probably caused by noise. Uh, how to protect against these noise today? We have the earplugs or stopples, the commercial 
but their effect is of course about 20 decibel. It's not too much or maximum 30 decibel. Um, and the other is the earmuffs. And when you try to combine them, it doesn't help more. So that's the problem uh, of both. We have uh, certain covering, but uh, of course not maximum enough, uh, for instance, when you work on an airport. Now hearing aids, a very short overview of what is done. The best is of course with the, uh, with the ear. And this is very old knowledge and you must try yourself. When you turn your head 30 degree to this side and you put your hand behind the ears, try that. Try it without first, uh, I am now speaking and you look at me and now you turn your head and try this and you will s see uh, I am speaking louder. Is that true? Double loudness. So that's the easiest help, yeah? And you can see it in this. It's a very easy test. You see it here in, it was often painted and it was even <laughs> here by the Greece. This is a figure of Dionysos and Dionysos uh, was the um, judge in competitions. There were big competitions in lyric, lyric players and so on. And that he could better decide who is the better musician, he, uh, he was, he carried this, here you see, enlarged ears. So, and you, you see he's looking a little bit turning, so he does the same. And that is in an old Greek vase from uh, uh, 500 before Christ. So in old things they used even instruments to do that. And then of course they use horns like this. This is from the 19th century and 20th century. And then uh, the electroacoustic hearing aids uh, area started with pocket instruments with carbons like telephone or yeah, that is good because it's in your museum. This is a massage apparatus for the drum head. When you put in pressure, uh, psh, 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 and this is the tube for it, here is this, this comes into the ear, and now you put on this machine and makes psh, 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 psh. then you move your drum head. And the people with uh, nerv nervous hearing loss, they say, oh yes, I can hear very well. After a week they come back, doctor, you must do it again. And we got money for it until I think 20 years ago. You got for it three D mark, yeah? And when I started as a young doctor and I was in outside praxis from the university, they came, doctor, yes, you must do it. It's the same with sucking the tonsils. You know the, what it is? You have a little glass tube uh, in form of a little cup and you put it on the tonsil and you suck out the yellow stuff and they say ah oh, it's fantastic and they come back after a week and but that's something the old people have and this apparat you have in your hospital in your medical museum exactly the same look this is yours yeah here you have it nicely the you see tube by this you make massage for the muscle yeah that was also a big fashion when you had some problems with you like this, all this big machine, 1930. Yeah, then we go on to the transist hearing aids and then the uh, behind ear and now starts the in ear, here is for the external meatus and that is in the concha and the most <coughs> modern from the external ear uh, is, is this, this is four millimeter and you see how complicated it is uh, made. And it is in front of the drum head. Yeah? It's fantastic, the development. And the last, of course, is the cochlear implant. By this we can make even newborn hearing when their he uh, hearing nerves are intact. And I think it comes to my end. And I think you have dinner soon. And I thank you very much. <laughs>